Of All Things by Robert C. Benchley. Chapter 5. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gardening Notes. During the past month, almost every paper, with the exception of the agricultural journals, has installed an agricultural department containing short articles by Lord Northcliffe or someone else in the office who had an unoccupied typewriter, telling the American citizen how to start and hold the interest of a small garden. The seed catalogue has become the catechism of the patriot, and if you don't like to read the brusque, prosy directions on planting as given there, you may find the same thing done in verse in your favorite poetry magazine, or a special department in the plumbing age under the heading the plumber's garden, how and when to plant. But all of these editorial suggestions appear to be conducted by professionals for the benefit of the layman, which seems to me to be a rather one-sided way of going about the thing. Obviously, the suggestions should come from a layman himself, in the nature of warnings to others. I am qualified to put forth such an article because of two weeks' service in my own backyard, doing my bit for Peter Henderson and planting all sorts of things in the ground without the slightest expectation of ever seeing anything of any of them again. If, by any chance, a sprout should show itself, unmistakably the result of one of my plantings, I would be willing to be quoted as saying that nature is wonderful. In fact, I would take it as a personal favor, and would feel that anything that I might do in the future for nature would be little enough in return for the special work she went to all the trouble of doing for me. But all of this is on condition that something of mine grows into manhood. Otherwise, nature can go her way, and I go mine, just as we have gone up till now. However, although I am an amateur, I shall have to adopt, in my writing, the tone of a professional or I shall never get anyone to believe what I say. If, therefore, from now on I sound a bit cold and unfriendly, you will realize that a professional agricultural writer has to have some dignity about his stuff, and that beneath my rough exterior I am a pleasant enough sort of person to meet socially. Preparing the Ground for the Garden This is one of the most important things that the young gardener is called upon to do, in fact, a great many young gardeners never do anything further. Some inherited weakness, something they never realized they had before, may crop out during this process. Weak back, tendency of shoulder blades to ossification, misplacement of several important vertebrae, all are apt to be discovered for the first time during the course of one day's digging. If on the morning following the first attempt to prepare the ground for planting, you are able to walk in a semi-erect position as far as the bathtub, and without outside assistance lift one foot into the water, you may flatter yourself that you are, joint for joint, in as perfect condition as the man in the rubber heels advertisements. Authorities differ as to the best way of digging. All agree that it is impossible to avoid walking about during the following week as if you were impersonating an old colored waiter with a lumbago, but there are two schools, each with its own theory, as to the less painful method. One advocates bending over without once raising up until the whole row is dug. The others, of whom I must confess that I am one, feel that it is better to draw the body to a more or less erect position after each shovelful. In support of this contention, Greitz, the well-known authority on the muscles of the back, says on page 233 of his Untersuchungen über Sichleikitsdelikite and Geschelsistraf Biology, the constant tightening and relaxing of the latissimus dorsi effected in raising the body as the earth is tossed aside has a tendency to relieve the strain by distributing it equally among the Serratus Posticus Inferior and the corner of 34th Street. He then goes on to say practically what I have said above. 
the necessity for work of such a strenuous nature in the mere preliminaries of the process of planting a garden is due to the fact that the average backyard has, up till the present time, been behaving less like a garden than anything else in the world. You might think that a backyard, possessed of an ordinary amount of decency and civic pride, would, at some time during its career, have said to itself, Now look here, I may some day be called upon to be a garden, and the least I can do is to get myself into some sort of shape, so that, when the time comes, I will be fairly ready to receive a seed or two. But no, year in and year out, they have been drifting along in a fool's paradise, accumulating stones and queer indistinguishable cans and things, until they were prepared to become anything, quarries, iron mines, notions counters, anything but gardens. I have saved in a box all the things that I have dug from my backyard, and when I have them assembled, all I will need will be a good engine to make them into a pretty fairly decent runabout. Nothing elaborate, mind you, but good enough to run the family out in on Sunday afternoons. And then there are lots of other things that wouldn't even fit into the runabout. Queer-looking objects they are. Things that perhaps in their heyday were rather stunning, but which have now assumed an air of indifference, as if to say... Oh, call me anything, old fellow, ice-pick, mainspring, cigar-lighter, anything, I don't care. I tell you, it's enough to make a man stop and think. But there, I mustn't get sentimental. In preparing the soil for planting, you will need several tools. Dynamite would be a beautiful thing to use, but it would have a tendency to get the dirt into the front hall and track up the stairs. This not being practicable, there is no other way but for you to get at it with a fork. Oh, don't be silly. A spade and a rake. If you have an empty and detached furnace boiler, you might bring that along to fill with the stones you will dig up. If it is a small garden, you ought not to have to empty the boiler more than three or four times. Any neighbor who is building a stone house will be glad to contract with you for the stones, and those that are left over after he has got his house built can be sold to another neighbor who is building another stone house. Your market is limited only by the number of neighbors who are building stone houses. On the first day, when you find yourself confronted by a stretch of untouched ground which is to be turned over, technical phrase meaning to turn over, you may be somewhat at a loss to know where to begin. Such indecision is only natural and should cause no worry on the part of the young gardener. It is something we all have to go through with. You may feel that it would be futile and unsystematic to go about digging up a forkful here and a shovelful there, tossing the earth at random, in the hope that in due time you will get the place dug up. And so it would. The thing to do is to decide just where you want your garden and what its dimensions are to be. This will have necessitated a previous drawing up of a chart, showing just what is to be planted and where. As this chart will be the cause of considerable hard feeling in the family circle, usually precipitating a fist fight over the number of rows of onions to be set out, I will not touch on that in this article. There are some things too intimate for even a professional agriculturist to write of. I will say, however, that those in the family who are standing out for onions might much better save their time and feelings by pretending to give in and then later in the day sneaking out and slipping the sprouts in by themselves in some spot where they will know where to find them again. Having decided on the general plan and dimensions of the plot, gather the family about as if for a cornerstone dedication and then make a rather impressive ceremony of driving in the first stake by getting your little boy to sing the first twelve words of some patriotic air. If he doesn't know the first twelve, any twelve will do. The idea is to keep the music going during the driving of the stake. The stake is to be driven at an imaginary corner of what is to be your garden, and a string stretched to another stake at another imaginary corner, 
and there you will have a line along which to dig. This will be a big comfort. You will feel that at last you have something tangible. Now all that remains is to turn the ground over, harrow it, smooth it up nice and neat, plant your seeds, cultivate them, thin out your plants, and pick the crops. It may seem that I have spent most of my time in advice on preparing the ground for planting. Such may well be the case, as that was as far as I got. I then found a man who likes to do those things, and whose doctor has told him that he ought to be out of doors all the time. He is an Italian, and charges really very little when you consider what he accomplishes. Any further advice on starting and keeping up a garden, I shall have to get him to write for you. End of chapter 5 Recording by Melora